Hi everyone! Thanks for joining this Meteorite Crash Course as part of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory's virtual open house programming. My name is Marina Gemma and today I'll be taking you through a quick introduction to rocks that are truly out of this world, better known as meteorites. First, a little bit about me. I'm a PhD student at Columbia University and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory but I do my research at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where I study meteorites. At past Lamont Open Houses, I brought actual meteorites to share with you all, but since we are virtual this year, I'll be sharing these awesome space rocks with you virtually as well. If you have any specific questions for me, you can join me on Reddit on Wednesday, October 21st from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern for an Ask Me Anything session. The AMA link will be on Lamont's Open House website. So first off, what is a meteorite? A meteorite is defined as a solid body of extraterrestrial material that penetrates the atmosphere and reaches Earth's surface, essentially just a rock from space. Terminology is important when discussing meteorites. We just define meteorites as solid extraterrestrial material, but depending on the physical location of that material, these rocks can be called something different. The majority of rocks come from asteroids, rocky bodies that aren't big enough to be planets. Let's say a piece of rock is broken off of an asteroid. This would be called a meteoroid. That same rock is then called a meteor when it enters Earth's atmosphere, also called a shooting star but it's only called a meteorite once it hits Earth's surface. So where are meteorites found? If all meteorites made large impact craters like this, they'd be fairly straightforward to find. This is an image of Meteor Crater in Arizona, a crater caused by what scientists estimate to be an impactor about 150 feet in diameter. But the majority of meteorites aren't as large as the impactor responsible for meteor crater. Most of the specimens on this page could fit in the palm of your hand. So how and where do we find these smaller specimens? Meteorites are most commonly found in deserts, specifically Antarctica and the Sahara Desert, followed by the Arabian Peninsula, Australia, and the deserts of North America. As you can see from this map, however, it isn't just because more meteorites fall in these deserts. Rather, it's just easier to recover them from deserts than it is from forests and oceans. The map you're looking at on the top right of the slide shows fireballs reported by US government sensors. And a fireball is essentially just a bright meteor, one that's big enough to be detected as it's coming through the atmosphere, typically by weather radar instruments. The National Science Foundation actually sends scientists to Antarctica each year to collect meteorites off of the ice fields. Here you're looking at an image of the South Miller Range in Antarctica, taken by another scientist from Lamont, Ellen krapcher Pajant, who actually got to go on one of these Antarctic meteorite collecting expeditions. But not all of these rocks are meteorites and picking out which one is a meteorite takes a little bit of work. You really have to know what you're looking for to pick out this tiny meteorite amongst all the terrestrial rocks. Up next, how did these meteorites form? After the sun formed about 4.6 billion years ago, it left behind a disk of hot gas and dust called the protoplanetary disk. The protoplanetary disk eventually evolved to form the planets and asteroids that we see today. And meteorites are samples of these different solar system objects. So the formation process varies slightly depending on what type of meteorite you're looking at. As the protoplanetary disk began to cool, material began to condense out of it. And on a large spatial and time scale, this material accreted or stuck together to form undifferentiated planetesimals and eventually differentiated bodies like the planets we know today. 
So why do we care about meteorites? What do they tell us? Well, different meteorites tell us different things. They're broadly split into three different categories, chondrites, achondrites, and primitive achondrites. And the figure you're looking at on this slide is essentially the meteorite family tree. And although it looks complicated, what I want you to take away from this is that there are a lot of different kinds of meteorites. And if you have a specific question that you're trying to answer, you need to know what meteorite to look at to answer that question. Broadly, meteorites tell us about the asteroid belt and asteroids in general, since the majority of meteorites come from these solar system objects. More specifically, meteorites tell us about planetary structure. Achondritic meteorites are meteorites from differentiated planetary bodies. So planetary bodies that grew large enough to form a core, a mantle, and a crust, just like Earth has. And we have meteorites that represent the core material, mantle material, and crust material in our collections. And you might be wondering, how do we get samples of these different interior layers of a differentiated body? The solar system was so chaotic in its infancy that planetesimals were broken apart by impacts with each other. And it was so chaotic that you could actually expose the iron core of these planetesimals. And that's how we get the iron meteorites in our collections today. This is an example of an iron meteorite, which likely came from the core of a differentiated planetesimal. What you're seeing in this photo is what we call a widman stoughton pattern. So this is a unique pattern of interwoven nickel and iron crystals that you see in some iron meteorites. And it's unique to meteorites because it is formed due to the slow cooling rates of this iron material. Here we have another example of an iron meteorite. Though there isn't a widman stoughton pattern visible, you can see what the outside of an iron meteorite looks like. It's a little bit darker on the outside because meteorites form a fusion crust as they come through Earth's atmosphere due to the extreme temperatures that they experience. Here we have what is perhaps my favorite type of meteorite called a palisite. Palisites are essentially mixtures of the iron nickel metal you find in a planet's core with the silicate minerals you find in a planet's mantle. The silvery material you see in this image is the iron and nickel metal, and the brown and green crystals that you're seeing are actually the mineral olivine, which happens to be the most common mineral we find in Earth's mantle as well. Meteorites range from the primary condensed solids in the solar system to pieces of fully formed planets. These samples span the period of planetary formation, so they tell us a lot about the early solar system and the environment of planet formation. One of the most important things we have learned from meteorites, though, is the age of the solar system. So certain inclusions inside chondritic meteorites, such as the one circled here, are actually the oldest objects in the solar system. These inclusions were the first things, the first solid things to form after the sun formed in our solar system. So scientists have used isotopic dating to calculate how old our solar system is. Why are these meteorites important? They're important because they can actually be very dangerous. Meteors and meteorites can have devastating effects for life here on Earth. A large impact in what is now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico is largely thought to have led to the extinction of dinosaurs on Earth. We see evidence of impacts all over the world, but only a few are as large as the impact that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs, and these are craters over about 100 kilometers in diameter. And this is precisely why these meteorites are important. They're pieces of asteroids that can end up being potentially hazardous to life here on Earth. And these asteroids are everywhere. Most meteorites come from asteroids and can vary wildly in size. And so we study these meteorites to better understand the asteroids that they come from. 
in an effort to better predict the potential hazards that they pose. Tens of thousands of asteroids have been discovered in recent years, and we are still unable to effectively detect certain sizes of asteroids. There is a category of asteroid called near-Earth asteroids, and these are just asteroids that are within a certain distance from Earth. There's about 17,000 of these near-Earth asteroids, and they're monitored due to the potential risk that they pose. And they're actually fairly warm, which I found surprising. On the near-Earth asteroid Itakawa, the average daytime temperature is actually about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The graph on the lower right shows the number of asteroids discovered over time. And what this really is good at illustrating is that the more we look for asteroids, and especially so in recent years, the more that we're finding. So there are still more out there to be found, tracked, and understood to hopefully better protect Earth in the future. There's another class of asteroid called potentially hazardous asteroids. So this is a subset of the near-Earth asteroid class. And they're called potentially hazardous because they pass within about 20 times the distance of the moon to Earth. And also they're very dim, so they're a bit hard to detect. And there's about 2,000 of these known as of January 2020, which means that they're just a small subset of the nearest asteroid population. And they're quite small. Only about 150 of these are over a kilometer in diameter. You may have seen the Chelyabinsk meteor back in the news in 2013. This is a really good example of the damage that a meteor can do. The Chelyabinsk meteor was about 20 meters or less in diameter. It shattered windows across six cities and hospitalized over 100 people, mostly due to injuries from broken glass. And the shock wave that this meteor released was about 20 times more, or had about 20 times more energy than a World War II atomic bomb. And most of this meteor broke apart during atmospheric entry because its path was very oblique, meaning that if its path was more perpendicular to Earth's surface, it would have likely caused a large impact crater. Because meteorites and the parent body asteroids they come from can be potentially hazardous, there are many missions that scientific agencies have sent and are sending to asteroids to better understand these small bodies. The major goal of these missions is to characterize these objects, and we have learned much about the nature of both main belt and near-Earth asteroids from these efforts. It's a particularly exciting time currently because both NASA and JAXA have active sample return missions at near-Earth asteroids, meaning that these missions are going to pick up pieces of these asteroids and return them to Earth. Sample return missions are the most ideal way to learn about asteroids and their compositions, but these are very expensive and time intensive. The majority of compositional information about asteroids has come from remote observations, either from orbiting spacecraft or ground-based telescopes. These options are much cheaper than sample return missions, so it is important to optimize this method of data collection. But arguably the best way to learn about asteroid composition is to use the asteroid samples that we already have, which are meteorites. So what are these meteorites made of? This picture is of a chondritic meteorite about the size of your hand. Essentially, a chondrite is an extraterrestrial sedimentary rock. You can see the different textures, sizes, and shapes of the components in the chondrite here. The main components in chondritic meteorites are calcium aluminum rich inclusions, chondrules, and matrix. The calcium aluminum rich inclusions are actually the oldest solid material that we have in the solar system. So these are those fluffy pieces that I pointed out earlier that we have used to calculate the age of the solar system. 
The chondrules are these spherical silicate inclusions that are rich in magnesium and iron. And the matrix is the sandy fine grained dust that kind of holds all these other inclusions together. So you can see the different components accreted together in this image. The old calcium aluminum inclusions are the light fluffy looking material and the circular components are these chondrules, silicate material that has experienced melting. And again, they're all held together by this fine grained sandy matrix. So when we want to study a meteorite, we want to look even deeper at these components, which means that we have to use specialized instruments to answer the questions that we have. So this blue rectangle gives you an idea of the size of a sample that I would take from a meteorite. This is about the size of my pinky. And the first thing we do is we want to look at the 3D structure of the meteorite. So at the American Museum of Natural History, we have a computed tomography or CT scanner. And if you've ever had a medical CAT scan, this is essentially the same technology. But instead of looking at a body part, we're looking at a piece of a meteorite in a CAT scan. So what this CT scan does is map density. So the brightest materials are the most dense. So typically this is your metal. And as the materials get less bright, the density decreases. And so we look at these different components in order to better understand how they formed and in extension, what the environment in the early solar system was like that led to the formation of the planets that we see today. And for my last little bit here, we'll look at what makes a meteorite or a meteor wrong. So if you found a rock out on a walk, how would you tell it's a meteorite? Some things to look for are density and smoothness. So because meteorites are abundant in metal, including stony meteorites, not just iron meteorites, they are a little bit more dense than a rock from Earth of a similar size. So one, the first thing you would wanna look at is density. And also because meteorites have traveled through the atmosphere and experienced extreme amounts of friction, the outside of the rock melts and forms what we call a fusion crust. So typically on a meteorite, you'll have a darker exterior and a lighter interior. Meteorites are also magnetic, again, because they have a lot of metal in them, they will attract a magnet. So that's another thing you would want to check in your mystery rock. And if you found a chunk of metal and you think it's an iron meteorite, another thing to look for would be the Widmanstone pattern that forms due to very slow cooling rates and exalves these iron and nickel crystals that you can see in these images. A few things to look for that will immediately tell you that you have a meteor wrong or just another rock from Earth are a spherical shape, so meteorites aren't usually spherical. Crystals, so if you have clear or white crystals like quartz, you won't find quartz in meteorites. And holes, so if you see a rock with holes in it, that is most definitely not a meteorite. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, I encourage you to join my Reddit AMA on Wednesday, October 21st from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, and the link will be on the Open House website. Thanks so much.